It's Michelle here, founder of IHopeMoms.com, mom to three little ones, and wife to a CrossFit Games athlete that definitely keeps me on my toes. If you're like me, I'm all about everything, growth mindset, creating a life we love, and getting around high thinkers to create super kids in life. I have an amazing guest that has influenced my life for nearly two decades. We met when we were young, starting our businesses before we had kids, and now here we are today. I have Master David Alvis on with me, director of the renowned USK Karate Schools, founder of Financial Fitness and Focus, and FFF for Biz. If you are following him, you know the wisdom I'm talking about. I was listening to his last um, mini podcast, and then I went back and I listened to every single one. I'm like, oh, I got to have him on for Creating Super Kids. So thanks for being on with me, Master David Alvis. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's funny when you said we've known each other for 20 years. The first thing is I thought of is we knew each other back when I had hair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I will never forget meeting you. You were leading an entire auditorium filled with families and our amazing community. And at your young age at that, to see the amount of impact that you are making and still making today in creating kids of character, of integrity, of work ethic, creating connected families that are rising together. It is just monumental to watch. And I am really excited today to help more families understand the secrets to you creating what you create each and every day at USK Karate and, and FFF for Biz. So let's get started. My first question for you is something that you actually talked about on your last parenting um, notes for the day. And what is the number one thing the parents should focus on when forcing their kids to do something. And I say this, and I know our gentle parents are gonna be like, ah, I'm logging off. And then the super competitive parents are gonna be like, oh, I'm interested to hear. And your answer to this, I thought was so wise, because there are times when we have to gently guide them for them to experience what they like. I mean, I've got a middle child that I definitely guided into coding and wanted her to try it. She walks out, she's like, I'm so sorry I ever complained. I'm really good at that, mom. And it was like pulling teeth to get her in there. So I yeah. want to hear your advice into that pushing, pulling, guiding, nurturing, and what's the best way to create the super kid? Thank you. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, so I learned this from my father-in-law, who was a master level therapist, um, it, uh, was a teacher at uh, Cornell University, super brilliant. You know, he had a PhD, two masters. And I was fortunate enough that I spent every Monday night with him for uh, about 15 years before he passed away, uh, learning about psychology, children's psychology, stages of development, all these different things that we incorporated into USK. And this topic came up frequently. And I asked him, how do you know when it's okay to force a child to do something? And he helped me realize that we force our kids to do things every single day because there's a, there's a perceived value behind the things that we force them to do, right? So I always use the example of like brushing teeth, right? We don't let our children not brush their teeth for a month just because they don't feel like doing it because we understand what will happen definitively if they don't do it, right? They're gonna run into major dental issues that will be very painful and very expensive. So we force our kids to do it. We know that eating ice cream all day long is not a healthy thing that can lead to diabetes and illness and other things. So we force our children to eat healthy and minimize the desserts and the sweets. So. We are very comfortable as parents forcing our children to do things that we perceive to be the correct thing to do. Where the gray area is and where most parents struggle is when there is not a universal perceived value towards something. For example, signing your child up for martial arts, signing them up for golf, signing them up for piano or coding, as you brought up. Because the whole world doesn't necessarily agree or even understand the value of those um, activities, the verdict isn't out on whether or not we should force them to do it. So what my father-in-law taught me 20 years ago was you have to filter all the decisions as a parent through a question. And that question is, what is in the highest and best interest of the child? 
not necessarily what is going to make you feel like uh, it's something you wished you would have done when you were 15 years old or 10 years old, because that's a really bad way to filter decisions. It's not, you know, trying to heal the woundings or the missed opportunities of our childhood. It's what is in the highest and best interest of your child? Are they going to need these skill sets for the rest of their life? What they're learning there, is it going to make an impact in their ability to handle tough situations one day or to uh, do well in a job interview? Or even just be able to get down on one knee and ask somebody to marry them. Is it going to help them lead their highest and best version of themselves in their lifetime? If the answer is yes, and they're lacking in that skill and they need that skill, you force them the way you force them to brush their teeth. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is so key as we talk about this topic, which leads me into a side topic of this. You know, you have led thousands of kids over your years uh, at US Kid Karate, and I have just seen this beautiful, powerful, impactful community that you and Jillian and your entire leadership team has created. Is there something that you notice along your journey coaching and mentoring all of these children that you recognize as their innate gift, as their potential that's inside of them that maybe mom or dad hasn't recognized yet and what would your advice be to parents we're so overwhelmed david and what would be your advice because you're the coach or the teacher that can zoom out and see a different perspective than the parent how do we as overwhelmed busy parents tap into our kids innate potential it's a great question um so i don't see a common uh well no that's it's not exactly an innate potential that I see common in, in every child. But what I do see common in every child it, is that they are not as fragile as we think they are. Interesting. Children are very, very resilient and naturally smart and also very perceptive. For example, um, you know, sometimes we have a bad day as parents and we do our very best to kind of shield our children from that negative energy. And we just try to make sure we cook dinner, clean the house, get them to their activities, help them with their homework. All the while we're stressed in our mind about, you know, whatever's going on at work or whatever. And then our kids will kind of look at us while we're driving in the car and they'll look at it in the rear view mirror and they'll go, mom, are you okay? And, and you sit there going, how the heck do they know? Because they, they, they haven't developed the filters that we've developed over 20, 30, 40, 50 years of living. They're still very, in tune with that that energy and they don't filter it so when they feel it they they say something so i think that one children when you get out of their way and let them feel a little bit of pain a little bit you know let them struggle a little bit let them work through things a little bit you know i always tell my kids look you're gonna swim and the water may get up to your nose, but I'm not going to let you drown, but you are going to swim. It's good. You know? It's really good. So, so, you know, that's how our perspective is, is I'm in the water with you and, and, and I'm going to make sure you don't go under permanently, but you're going to do everything under your power to figure out how to stay above water and how to get back on land. And yeah. what I've learned is 99 out of a hundred times, if you get out of their way and they know that they don't have a safety net, they're going to figure it out because children are very strong, very smart, and very resilient. Yeah. Oh, man. That is so powerful. And I think we, you and I are talking pre-show about, you know, business and, and some of those situations. I think we as adults can learn a lot from that is that there is no safety net. Sometimes you just have to sink right? yeah. and swim and get out of it and find a way and pivot and get better and grow. Right. And our and kids have the innate ability to do that. I would add for parents who are listening to this, that maybe that makes them feel some anxiety to hear that and that they're, that, you know, that they want to try that, but it makes them feel anxiety. Don't start with big things. You know, in martial arts, you start as a white belt, right? And then you go to black belt. The, the white belts don't do black belt things, right? Justin is in CrossFit. His first day in CrossFit is not like how he trains today, right? So everybody should start with very small challenges and build their strength. Because if you just try to go from, hey, I, I 
protected my child from everything because I don't want them to feel pain to, yeah. hey, I'm going to throw them in the water and let them go. That may be a little bit of a shock. But if you, yeah. if you go on little by little and build that muscle, build your parenting muscle up, so to speak, your, your child will follow suit. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's great advice. I mean, we had that happen in our house today. You know, my middle schooler now was like, she got all hundreds on her test last week, came this week. She's like, man, mom, I, I did not do good on the science test that I thought I crushed. And I'm like, you know what? Is there something that you missed fundamentally? She's like, no, I studied. I knew the material. I'm like, okay, I'm thinking in my brain. Where's the learning? Mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously there's something about the way the test was orchestrated that you need to recognize and think back on what did I miss? Maybe a step. You know, you know that you need to keep things nice and tidy so that everything can be seen clearly. And she thought about that and processed that. And my innate mama bear was like, man, I need to get test taking done or I need to hire a tutor to go over there or Anjali, you need to go ask about extra extra help or something like that. And I'm like, you know what, Anj? Hey, in life, we don't have everything given to us. In a job, you may win some, you may lose some, but you just have to figure out how do I grow from this experience? So instead of me hopping in, trying to save her and figure it out, like we just need to have that continuing conversation. I'm like, hey, this one didn't go your way. Like, what do we need to change and get better in? And I, I think, think that, that, I'm sorry that moment know. like went on for her to grow in her own instead of mom saving her. And it was a really powerful moment. I think that is such a powerful point that you brought up because I think for parents, we forget to look at ourselves and realize we're not good at everything. Like I know as a business owner, like I have like 5% of what I'm really good at. And the other 95%, I better have really good employees and partners and vendors that can fill that void because otherwise I'd go out of business. Um, and it's funny though, like we recognize that about ourselves as parents, but we want our children to be a hundred percent at everything. And it's like, so wait a minute, I'm good at two things, but I want my child to get a pluses in all, all subjects. <laughs> I don't, I honestly, it, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but I don't understand it. And I don't raise our children that way. And I don't teach children at USK that way. You know, we have to find our responsibility as parents. One of them is to help our children find their gift, right? And have a certain level of competency in everything else. And then recognize that will always kind of be a challenge and that we need to lean on the strengths and learn to walk that balance as we, as we get older. So, you know, I, I kudos to you for making that, that pivot with, with your daughter. No, I love that. I love what you're saying. It's a great next point to reminder when we talk about it later today is like, you're not going to be great at everything, but you do have to have a level of competency and, and excellence and work ethic and just neatness of work and trying your best. That's all that I can really ask. Yes. For. It's a great baseline there, which leads me to my next topic, which is what would you say in being director of USK? And again, your own children are fabulous. Um, I think you and your wife are just incredible. Your wife's a teacher. I mean, you guys have major insight into child development. How do we best build our children's self-confidence? Uh, it kind of goes back to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago. Um, incremental, purposeful, deliberate, well thought out steps. So a lot of times, I just did a, a, a big two hours uh, live seminar on this with, with uh, parents about uh, building confidence in children, especially through challenges and things they don't want to do or things they're afraid of. And a lot of parents will read a great book or they'll listen to a great podcast like yours and they get very excited and very empowered. And then the next morning, they jump out of bed and all of a sudden, it's a different household and it's like, all right, kids, we're going to do this today and this is going to happen and it's a new day and everyone is like, whoa, 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 whoa. And it never sticks because it wasn't implemented in a slow, progressive manner. So for, for us as parents, I always, I always remind parents to think about how you would want something to happen because children, are the, they're humans. Just because they're younger, they're still humans and they feel the exact same things we feel. So... If I were to go to work and my boss wanted to revolutionize the office, I would not want to walk in on Monday and it'd be a completely, totally different setting with totally different expectations. I would want to know what's the game plan, what are the steps we're going to take to get there, what's the reward system for doing it, what's going to happen if we don't meet goals, 
Let's train on it. And then in one month, we're going to launch. Yeah. So um, we don't do this with children because we think they're children and they just are going to do whatever we tell them to do. And yeah. it's not good for them. They, they need steps. They need a vision. They need to be given expectations for success and failure. Um, one of the expressions that we use to put it in simple terms for children is when you do good, you get good. When you do yeah. bad, you get bad. So yeah. if you do the things I'm telling you to do, you should expect a good, a good outcome. But if you don't, don't expect a good outcome from doing, you know, the wrong things or, or, or omitting what you should be doing. So I think basically break it down into small steps, start with small challenges, start with small expectations, build it up over time. Not, and time is not a month. Time is years, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and just, Ramp it up slowly. You know, you, you, you do a little bit every day and you add that up over 10 years, it turns out to be a whole lot. Yeah, and I love what you're saying. You know, and I help moms. I get coaching from Coach Allen, who's a teacher and a Jai Parenting certified coach every month because I have three very different personalities and the girls in my house. And I know that it's not a one size fit all. So I have to be super intentional about my mentoring, my guiding, my nurturing, my communication patterns to each and every one of them. And guess what? It takes a lot of work. And I think that is one of the most underspoken about things in parenting is that it's not on autopilot. It's not on coast. It's really takes work. And so I always like to be honest and authentic, David, in these conversations to talk about the real strategy. I like to kind of rip the veil down of like the perfect look of the parent or the family oh. and really talk about like applicable strategies. So I know I use our I Help Moms coaches to help me achieve the blueprint the strategy, what would the timetable to roll something like this out? I also listen to you. I'm, I'm big on teaching our kids financial and fiscal responsibility so they understand it when they enter the real world. So we start teaching now because learning abundance mindset, learning about wealth doesn't happen when they hit 18. That's a total pipe dream. That's like not even going to happen. So we want to teach them why they're seven, nine and 11. So, you know, what do you and your wife or you and USK do? to really applicably teach these in small progressions? Is it like over dinner on Sunday nights? Is it, I know your family, like our family, we love to break bread. Is it something that you um, might watch a podcast or listen to something like this or read a good book and, and you and your wife sit down, roadmap it, and you're like, hey, let's bring this up the first Monday of the month and then see what the boys think about it and go from there. Like, how do you actually do this? Yeah, that's a really good uh, point. And I love that you're breaking down the veils and the perfect parent because there's no such thing. Um, no matter how much we all try, we're going to screw our kids up in some way. There, there, there's just no way around that. Like you, you can have the best intentions, go to every seminar, speak to every expert, take all the notes and make it your entire business to be the perfect parent. And you will not be the perfect parent. Yep. And that's okay because it's actually a good thing for the children because every child needs to be able to look at their parents and say, you know, my parents did an amazing job with me and I love them and they took care of me. And these are all the things I'm going to take from them. But these three things, I think I'm going to take it up a notch when I have kids. And if that process doesn't take place, then, then the evolution of parenting stops. Yeah. Right. So a lot of parents get offended by that. Right. Like, oh, I can't believe they think that I didn't do that right. Like, that's great. If, if, if they if you if they look back and go, you didn't do that right or you did it. OK, I want to do it better. I'd be like, go for a kid. Like, yes. make it and run with it, man. Make your kids better. I mean, that's our job as parents is that our kids are awesome. better than us. Yeah. So that that I think is one. And then to come back to your question, um, the, the, the steps. It's a broad question because you're talking about an infinite number of topics. Like, are we trying to fix a behavior? Are we trying to teach them money? Are we trying to get them to compete in a golf tournament or a martial yeah. arts tournament? Are we trying to get them better at math or science? You know, let's, I know. Let's more. focus on like a behavior. Like, let's say, let's use this example. I can only speak for my family. At times I'll notice that the mornings are really rushed and I don't feel good about it. I'm trying to get them out to the bus. I get back, like I'm off. I don't feel connected to them. So let's just say we read a book or we listen to a great podcast about how to connect the family and really set ourselves up for better nights before leading into a better morning. And there's just fundamental things we have to change. 
how would you and your team approach something like that? Awesome. I love charts. Um, and to, to use the chart effectively, there, there does have to be a family meeting yeah. where the kids are involved. But before the family meeting, there needs to be a meeting of the CEOs, which yeah. is mom and dad. Yeah. That meeting needs to happen in private yeah. and sometimes may take more than one meeting because these conversations where you talk about a challenge with a child's behavior, you realize you and your spouse don't always share the same perspective about where the kids should be going or the expectation. And again, a lot of parents freak out when this happens and you shouldn't. Because when you combine two different perspectives and find the middle ground, you found balance. And that's what you're trying to achieve with children is the balanced approach. Not your approach, not your significant others, the one you both love. Yeah. So you, you, you come up with first, what's the expectation? Jill and I will do this over date night often. Uh, we go all religiously almost every Saturday night. We go and spend a few hours together. We have dinner. We go see a movie. We get foot massage. And we just talk about like, Okay, yeah. we're experiencing a challenge, all right? We're, we're having a hard, funny enough, we've, we've had the same challenge about mornings. We've talked about it. So what we did was we said, okay, this is the expectation. We created a chart. We then sat down with the kids, showed them the chart and said, listen, this is where we're experiencing a challenge as a family and we don't want to have a conflict here where we, it's not necessary to have one. So we're going to fix this. And here's how we're going to do it. And we outlined different line items in the chart like, Here's the bedtime, right? Here's the time that we stop eating at night because we noticed that if they snack too late into the light, it affects their sleeping, which affects them waking up, which makes the mornings hectic. So we line item everything that we expected. And it was a Monday through, through Sunday chart. And we start checking it off. And there was, hey, if you guys do well with this, here's the rewards. Yeah. If you fail at this, here are the consequences, like losing yeah. time on your iPad, right? Yeah. And um, also, we, we would say, look, we're going to give you guys a week to fall into rhythm, right? No consequences the first week, no rewards the first week. We're just going to practice the first week. On week two, this goes live. And that means on week two, if you're not going to bed when you're supposed to be going to bed, the consequences kick in, right? Yeah. So again, it's running it almost like a business, yeah. running your, your household like a business. Yeah. Yeah. And what would you say is the mental gain of that? I think a lot of parents listening will be like, ugh, I mean, I know you and I are both multi-business owners, so it's kind of like uh, a rhythm for us that we understand that. But maybe if you've never run a business and you're the parent that just wants to come home, kick your feet up, watch a football game with your kid and like say, yay, happy ever after, you know, what would you say is the mindset that you have around the benefit of putting that in place? What is the benefit to your kids? you know, five, 10 years from now. And then when their kids, that's, that's what comes to my mind is how much my kids are taking into then how they're going. To. That's a really powerful question. Um, so I heard two parts in there. The, the, the first one is you mentioned, you know, like coming home, kicking the, 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 the feet up watching football. I think when, when we listen to these types of podcasts, it, it almost sounds like the entire household in life 24 seven has to be like, and, and that's not healthy either. There needs to be documented schedule time. Like, hey, guys, at this time, we're going to make some popcorn. We're going to watch a movie. We're going to play board games. We're going to run around the backyard. Like, that has to be built in there. Because yeah. otherwise, like work, nobody wants to work seven days a week yeah. for, for six, eight. We need rest time to perform at our best. But so you're saying important. something really important. I think Grant Cardone talks a lot about this. I think Rob Deerdeck talks about this. Rob Deerdeck's one of the smartest guys I've ever heard. And they do. They schedule fun and it's just like really successful couples schedule couples time. Yep. And so I love that we're talking about this again, because I know Justin and I are workaholics and it's not always healthy to the level that we take it. So I have literally like I serve on Sunday, so I really get no break. So Saturdays I have said no, like so many people are always like, can you come to the gym? Aren't you there? Or don't you? And I'm like, I need like just a little bit to myself to have fun or else I'm not having fun in life. Yeah. All the time, you know, I'm just working all the time. And so sometimes saying no to things is also really powerful and scheduling in fun is actually a success secret that the super, super abundant people do, but they don't really talk about. So I love right. that you brought that up. I think that when you say no to something, you're saying yes to something else. Um, 
So one of the things that I'm big on when I give parenting talks is explaining that 99% of the problems with raising children is because there's problems amongst the, at the parent level. Um, it is very difficult to be an amazing parent when you are absolutely exhausted and stressed out because you're not working on yourself. Right. Yeah. And I'm the same way. Like you guys, like I love to work. I love to contribute and share, but there, there was a thing in my mind that, that happened about maybe five, six years ago where I recognized that if I don't actually make it a priority to, to do things I really love that I enjoy and relax every yeah. week, then I go, I, I get so stressed out and, and, mm -hmm. and I just lose myself. And then when I lose myself, I can't parent the way that I promised myself I was going to parent. So great communication amongst spouses is a top priority individual time. And by the way, I, I've never, I've yet to come across a situation where a person doesn't have the time. They just usually have guilt issues around creating the time or mindset issues around creating the time. But it's never when you look at the schedule that we can't find the time it's there. Yeah. Yeah. So personal fun time, time with your significant other and time with the family. And it, you know, it doesn't need to be, if you spend one hour as a family playing a board game, just one hour a week, and there's no interruption, no TV, no phone, and you are laughing and having a great time, that one hour can sustain you for the rest of the week. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, and the actual scientific studies on that, whether you're breaking bread together, playing games together, we love going down to Frost Museum together, whatever it is, the studies on the decrease of future depression, anxiety in your children are astounding. So again, I love that you bring that up. Now, one of the things that I learned being at USK Karate last week as I was listening to your incredible students, um, they talked about mastery of the body and self-control. And I thought this was so interesting. And the fact that so many of us parents are like, sit down or be quiet or do something that we adults want you to do and behave the way we expect you to behave. And when I listened to the wisdom at USK, I was really blown away. Uh, my third daughter has a lot of energy. She's on a different, um, different energy level of my other two kids. And so when I learned about your wisdom of how children developmentally view body control and mastering that, I really wanted to the rest of our parents to hear about your wisdom and how USK karate approaches this. And even the larger martial arts mindset, I found really fascinating. Thank you. That made my whole day um, to hear that because I, I didn't realize that they had brought that. I have not seen the podcast yet. It's being edited. So I'm looking forward to it. And to know that they brought that up is very, you know, it's, it's like a parent when, when you say something to your children over and over again and you don't think it's getting through. And then like six months later, you hear them talking to somebody else and they mention something that you brought up and you go, oh, man, I won. They did hear me. Right. They are listening. And um, OK, so the mastery of the body. I'm a I'm a very big believer in this. I know you guys are, too. I think that, look, we're born with one body. We can't go to Walmart and get another one when we mistreat this one, right? And I think that, that we come into this world with this body that is our, 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 our spaceship, our vehicle, our vessel to, to journey with. Like, to me, I think people spend more time and more energy on their, like, the car that's in their driveway. You know, like, if the check engine light comes on, people go bonkers to get it to the shop, Right. But then at the same time, people have no issue missing the gym for a month, right? It, to me, it, 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 it honestly, you know, we talk about pulling the veil back and, talk, and having real talk here. It drives me absolutely bonkers. It drives me bonkers. Alone, you talk about $6 a day to gym or martial arts or whatever it is. And then they spend $3,000 in one day on something that may or may not matter. Like the prioritization of things in life yeah. blows me away every day. Right. And, and the, the, the reason that I always say prioritize mastering the body first before you master anything else is because it was the thing you were given first. Mm, so. so it's like, you know, when I look at, you know, call it whatever you want, God, the energy in the universe, Buddha, whatever you want to call it. To me, that's a message. If, I, if this was the first thing that I came here with, 
I think that someone or something is trying to tell me something, right? So when you, when you learn to master the body, because the body does fluctuate minute by minute, uh, you know, muscle, nervous system, thoughts, fat levels, energy level, chemical levels are moving all the time. So when you learn to live in an equilibrium with your body, pretty much everything that you had to learn to master your body, you can almost apply it to any other concept in life. Because you're mastering something that's moving in a constant state of flux. Well, what about children? Aren't they in a constant state of flux? Right? Like every month, every day, my, you know, we have similar age children. I have 13 and an eight year old. Every morning, these kids wake up and something new pops out of their mouth because they, they elevate overnight. Right? So they're keeping us on our toes. So to me, when you learn to live with a body that is, you know, because right when we lifted weights when we were 20 is not the same when we're lifting weights in our 40s, right? I can't lift the way I used to live when I was 25. So learning how to manage that and accept, that's a big one, to accept that we are changing and to learn how to treat ourselves as we change. Well, then you can say, how do I learn to shift the way I treat my family as they change? Mm. Right. So we teach our children at USK that if you start at a young age learning how to master your body and the level of discipline it takes to master what you eat and how you train and how you sleep, everything else in life will become a lot easier. Because what think about it, what's the thing most people struggle with? Weight control. That is one of the biggest things people struggle with in this world. If you can learn how to master that, you got a big jump start on a lot of other things that are tough to master. Yeah. But you said something interesting too, you know, you have uh, many of your leadership team that have early childhood education degrees. Um, your own wife is absolutely brilliant. And so one of the things that I recognize is something my kids tell me a lot too. They're like, mom, I just sat at school all day. I load on the bus at 7 a.m. I'm sitting at school all day. And then you want me to go and sit and listen with, you know, my legs crossed and listen to another teacher for another two hours. And what I learned about USK is that that's actually not the way that you run your classes. You actually allow them to run their energy out. And so I want you to lean into that a little bit more because I think we're missing that as parents. I think that the kids are sitting at school all day and we're like, come home, sit in the car, listen, you know, do what I need you to do homework wise, sit with the tutor. Like, oh my gosh, we're just literally instructing our kids to sit, 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 and listen how we want them to listen. I, I just don't think that makes sense. But I think also there's another side to it that we need to understand. How do we help them get that energy out? Because it is, it's always moving, it's always changing, and there has to be a healthy way to balance. There is, that's a great, another great topic, thank you. So uh, first of all, um, coming back to what I said earlier about children are just like us. If you went to work for seven straight hours, I mean, wouldn't you want to come home and be like, listen, I just need, give me like 30 minutes to do whatever I want, right? Yes. Yes. So in our household, and what I've coached other parents on is when our children get home from school, they have an hour to an hour and a half to do whatever they want. I don't care what you do. You can go on your phone. You can do it because they just spent seven hours focused on listening, learning, writing. And here's another thing that we forget and we don't give our children credit for. They just spent seven hours in a brand new social environment because they're not masters at social skills yet. Right. And they're trying to figure out how do I get along with this kid that I like, but this kid doesn't like me, but I can't get into a fight with them. So how do I kind of jive with them when I don't like them? And they're learning all these social constructs. And then we want them to learn calculus and American history and world geography. And it's like, Oh, you know, you didn't do much today. Now come home and do four hours of homework. It's ludicrous, in my opinion. It's ludicrous. So I, mean, I even think like Justin, I don't know if you and Jillian talk about this, but Justin and I always talk about like, we have no other option than to be entrepreneurs because we literally cannot sit still for eight hours. That would be like torture. Right. I mean, I think that's why we own a gym. I think that's why it's a chiropractor. It's like, we just always want to be moving and growing and helping and serving, right. but not sitting. I right. can't even imagine. Huh? 
Yeah, and you know, for my, for my, for for, I recommend they do whatever. They, if if that means they want to go ride their bike, ride the bike. If it means they want to just play, like Jason is big into chess. Like he just wants to come home and he wants to just start playing chess and studying chess strategies because it brings him joy. Yeah. Right. And Brittany, our younger one, is like your youngest one. He's a nuclear power plant. Like he <laughs> he wants to just go outside and pretend he's the Flash. And he did this the other week. He got home from school and he took his phone out. And he was timing how fast he could run the cul-de-sac. That's amazing. <laughs> Two totally opposite children. I got one kid outside running the cul-de-sac, yep. and I got one kid playing chess on the inside. But how many oh, parents, yeah. by default, would say, get out of my house, go, without thinking about what you're saying? Like, maybe they don't want to go run around outside. I know I don't like swimming, right? If someone's like, you got to go swimming, but I don't want to go swimming. I don't like swimming. <laughs> Well, again, the thing, the reason why we allow them that total free time is because there is a structure in place for the rest of the week where they're going to get their exercise. And, and for example, like we recommend that most people lift weights anywhere from three to five times a week, right? Like for people that are in fitness like us, like even if you do twice a week, that's good. But three to five times is a really healthy number to lift weights. And we only, if you really lift hard, you only really need to live for 30 to 45 minutes each time you go in and you're good, right? But again, we don't treat children the same. We want them to go outside for four hours. I'm sorry, if I went to the gym for four hours, either I'm not working hard or I'm going to kill myself. Yeah, yeah. But why do we think that children have to do this? It's ludicrous, right? So that's number one. Um, uh, forgive me. I, I think you brought something else up about the. Uh, How you start the classes at USK? I found that really interesting. Oh, thank you. So I learned this from watching uh, Caesar Milan, the Dog Whisperer, and then mm -hmm. I I took it to my father-in-law and I said, "Hey, Caesar Milan said this. Is this crap or or is this good?" So what Caesar Milan says when he trains dogs is you have to do three things and you have to do them in three very specific order, right? In in a specific order. Um, exercise, discipline, and then love. Why is that? Dogs' brains run at a million miles an hour. So are children's. There's a lot of energy. So when you exercise, when the children start a class by running laps or doing an obstacle course, it takes just that little extra edge off of the energy level. So then the discipline doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're disciplining them. It means going through working on your discipline, right? What's your, like your craft. Right. So you work on your craft, martial arts, golf, football, baseball, basketball, d dance, soccer, whatever. Yeah. And then at the end is the love. The love is is the praise. It's the high five. It's the hug. It's the verbal confirmation. And when you do them in that order, you get a very powerful result. So uh, as teachers and as parents, we go into life with a game plan. Right. So maybe I want to do a class and I want to do this, this and this. And we've all had those days as teachers and parents where they are just off the chain and we can't get them to focus. I'll throw my lesson plan out the window and I'm, all right, we're doing an obstacle course. And I'll set a course up and for 15 minutes they run the course until I see that they start to slow down and are sweating and hyperventilating. When that happens, I know I've got their brain back. Yep. And when I've got their brain back, I can maybe salvage whatever I had on the lesson plan. And I think that's an important thing for parents here too, is you're going to have your plans and they're going to go off track quite often. And you've got to learn to pivot quickly. Yeah. It's so interesting. You say that I am honored to help um, a specific underserved camp during the summers. And I bring CrossFit coaches out and we do like workout after workout after workout with every single different age group. My first year, I tried to sustain working out for the hour, 45 minutes, and it went awful. Like the kids just would not pay attention. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, this is really, really hard. So I got smarter the next year and I let them run. And I just like front loaded the class with like all running, relays, fun, laughter. And then when I wanted to get down to the nitty gritty of proper, proper squatting technique, proper lifting technique, proper push up technique, all these things that people don't really pay attention to, they're ruining their shoulders, ruining their knees. Like I really wanted these kids to understand. So they go into life with proper form understanding. It's about lifelong health, not just lifting the load or like showing off. Right. And, um, and then of course the high fives, the love, and then empowering the older kids to come back and teach the younger kids. And yes. this year it was 
awesome. There is so much to what you're saying. And I think when we let go of our predisposition of our adult mindset and get into a childhood development appropriate mindset of asking how can we create a win for everyone in the morning, after school, on the weekends, like these are all such good things that you're giving us that I think as parents, we spend very little time actually making a game plan on, which I'm already thinking of for the January event you and I've talked about doing together. I think it'd be so powerful to help parents get the game plan right yes. with their children. Like that's the other thing. So I love everything you're saying. And another thing that I want to ask, you mentioned your oldest son liking chess, your youngest son loving to race around the cul-de-sac. What would be your advice to parents really wanting to find their children's zone of genius? Oh, my goodness. This may be my favorite question. Um, I understand the concern that all of us parents have that we want to expose our children to everything. We want them to experience this big, beautiful world and everything that's in it. Um, it. It is very rare that you are going to have a child that can do six different activities and do them at a very, very high level. It does happen, but, but it's less than 1%. Yep. The other 99% of children, in my opinion, having studied this for the last 21 years, is children do much better when they have one or two things that they're really good at instead of trying to master five different sports at one time, because the reason that we put children into sports when they're younger is to develop their self. Because the, look, what's the statistical odds that they're gonna take it to the pro level? The, the reality is 99% of children that play sports will not play it at the pro level. That's the that like a whole other topic that we have to talk about. Yeah. Like the reality of them really making it Right. So slim. Yeah, we put if, so much pressure on it. I don't understand. If you add up, we have almost 8 billion people in the world. And if you add up every professional athlete in soccer, baseball, football, basketball, you're talking about thousands, not even really tens and tens of thousands. You're talking about maybe ten, a couple ten thousand out of almost 8 billion. That is way less than 1% that make it to that level. And right? you're also not talking about how short their careers are. Yes. Maybe three years is the average. Right. So again, how do parents spot, aside from the traditional athletics, which I love what you're talking about, why we put them in athletics. It's a strong sense of self and collaboration and teamwork. Right. I mean, the lessons are numerous. Right. But how do we spot the peripheral of their zones of genius in a wider way that's not just the athletic paradigm per se? Right. You got to, so using, the, using that paradigm, you, you know, as a mirror for other things, you, you commit them to different things that they show interest in. Um, and you, you make sure that they try it for the full season. And when, when that season is over, you reflect with them. And if you have to move on to another one, like for example, our oldest son, uh, tried volleyball, showed up tremendous interest in it before, did it show and the interest dropped but it was still there and then did not want to go back and do another season of volleyball afterwards right so trying something for a season or a good time period good time period is usually around six months if it's not if it's not a seasonal type of activity yeah give it six months if it if it doesn't latch you don't need to keep doing it go to another thing and you will know as a parent when they find the thing that is their zone, because they'll go from being reminded that they need to get ready for this or get ready, you know, that they start, like, for example, Jason wakes up in the morning, he plays chess. He comes home from school, he plays chess. He goes on YouTube, he studies grandmaster chess moves. I'm not telling him to go do that. Yeah. You know, right now, that is his love right now. Who knows if it's going to stay? I don't care. Because the important thing for me is he's learning the underlying skill sets of studying something that you love, mm -hmm. giving so, it 100%, knowing that if you're going to master something, you cannot do it for five minutes and they think that you're great, you know? So he's learning what it takes to be successful. And I'm not worried at all that he's not going to find what his thing is. Like, that's just going to happen naturally. And our job as parents is just to ask questions to kind of see where they lean 
And they go, okay, if, you, if you're telling me that, maybe coding might be a great thing. Let's try coding. Oh, you're saying this? Maybe dance. Hey, let's let you you like uh, what you you like Tiger Woods. Let's try golf. You know, and then give it a season, and then if it doesn't stick, let it go. Yeah. No, I love that insight. I mean, I can only speak for myself. Um, I'm big on experiential coaching. So you know, our little one, I tried gymnastics for six months, spent all that money. Gymnastics is freaking expensive, and then she quit. She's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm like. Okay, we're not going to do gymnastics. And now yeah. she's seven and she can't get enough of it. She's tumbling everywhere. She wants to do it all day long. So I think there's also an important parenting conversation in there is yeah. that it can shift and change just like we as parents can shift and like tennis I love. I haven't done in a while. I can't wait to go back once things lighten up at work a little bit. It's like we all shift and change. So I, at least speaking for myself, always tell my girls. Until you figure out and can communicate to me what you love and what you're interested in, I'm going to take the initiative as your parent to put you in a wide variety of things. Oh, man. And I yep. want you to communicate to me. And as soon as you start recognizing something that sets your soul on fire, that makes you so happy to do, that you're excited to do, I will be right there nurturing that interest. And I will do everything in my power to make sure that you can fulfill it to your deepest heart's potential. But yeah. until then, we're going to try a lot of different things. Michelle, so, you, said, you said two things that are, I, I cannot tell you how impactful and powerful they are. And, and I talk about them all the time because my father-in-law and other coaches that I look up to said two things that you brought up. One, you said about the money, about, you know, the activity. A lot of parents get very hung up on, hey, I spent $5,000 for you to do a season and you didn't take it. See, I, I... I would invite parents to look at this from a different perspective. Yeah. If you spend $5,000 for your kid to do hockey for six months and then they never got anything out of it, you didn't spend $5,000 on hockey. You spent five, you invested $5,000 in an experience that is now permanently a part of your child about teamwork, sportsmanship, hard work. How about this lesson? doing something you don't want to do and finishing what you started. It, to me, I will spend $5,000 all day long, twice on Sunday. If, if my children walk away knowing that you're going to do things in life you don't want to do, but you're going to have to finish them and see them through, is that not worth $5,000? No, it's worth an infinite amount of money. So, so okay. I think that's a big part of what you said. The, the other one that you said was, um, you know, uh, re regarding like the, 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 com the commitment to doing something at a high level with like with, with your daughter, like she tried something and it led to, to, uh, she went from gymnastics to tumbling. Right. You know, I think that just the, the voices thing too was huge. What you said about you're going to be the voice for them. That is exactly how it needs to be done. What I tell my kids is, you're going to hear my voice in your head a lot of times when you don't know what to do. And my youngest son said, well, daddy, when will I know when I can make the decision? When am I going to know? And I said, when you stop hearing my voice in your head and it's your voice that you hear, then you know you're ready. So good. That's like a mic drop moment. Well, you, you, you said it. You were the one who said it. That was, that is a mic drop uh, point that I learned a long time ago that that I when I heard it it really knocked me back, you know because I think for parents we're all sitting here going, how do I know when they're ready to like take the ball and go on their own and do and believe me as as children they hear our voice in their heads and they hear our voice in our tone when it becomes their voice in their tone that means they've shifted and they've evolved and they've matured to another level. And it's time for them to go out and make their own mistakes and, and, and do things on their own. And I, I'm curious what you say about this too, on the subject that I find, I find just super important. And I always vow to be authentic and vulnerable when we talk about this stuff, because I, I don't want to be the perfect parent. Like, I don't, I just don't think that exists. So, right. you know, I have my oldest one who obviously I text her all the time about golf. She has transitioned from our voice to her voice and found her way. And then my youngest is like tumbling all over the place and just loves it. And it's, it's really neat to watch. My middle has not found her thing. She is absolutely brilliant. And so I have to be really cautious not to compare her to her sisters, because if I'm honest, 
is so much easier parenting kids that know what they love to do because mm -hmm. it's a lot less work on me and I can just figure out like, what do I get to do? We get to go golfing with her. We get to go have fun. I, I love going to gymnastics. I was a gymnast. Like it's so awesome, but my middle one has not found her thing yet. And so I just want to also have an addendum of how important it is not to compare siblings and not to infringe your own impatience as a parent on a child that just hasn't found their thing yet. And I'd love for you to speak into what can be our mindset as we are watching our kids find their voice, as we're watching our kids find their zone of genius. What might we want to be heart centered in and mindful in our own mindset along that journey? Because I a, think a lot of people live vicariously through their kids during this journey. Yes. And I think B, it could be really easy for me to call out my middle kid and be like, look at your older sister, look at your younger sister, let's go. But I literally have to be super conscious of just being patient. So what would your mindset and mindfulness and heart centeredness be for those parents that I think there's a lot of parents that their kid hasn't found their thing yet. And it can be terribly frustrating as you watch all the other parents post everything their kid's good at. <laughs> It can be really frustrating. <laughs> this is um, this is huge. Um, I think we all need to remember that every single one of us is individuals. Um, I know that when parents refer to their children as their mini me, I know they mean well, and I know that it comes from a heart and a place of love. And I understand the intention behind the words, but we need to be more careful with those words because they are not a mini you. They're not. They're them. And you're you. And you are two completely different human beings. And I think for parents to really embrace that, there's almost like a mourning process that has to happen at first because you, you know, for a lot of parents, you do look at them as an extension of yourself. Yeah. I, I personally do not look at my children as an extension of myself. I don't either. I, I wonder why I, that is. I, yeah. Um, I look at them as separate human beings that are on their own journey and that I was lucky enough to be put in place as their parent, their mentor, and their guide, and their guide. And here's another one. There's going to come a day where they don't want our mentorship and our guidance. And that's not an insult. To me, the day that, that where they decide they want to figure it out on their own is I did my job because that means they have enough courage and confidence to fail. And that they they can take the hit yeah. and they're still going to move forward. A lot of parents get very bent out of shape over that. And then the flip side of the coin, I've also said to my wife, you know, if they get to be 25 years old and they want to start a business or they have something going on in their life that they, they, they're they not quite sure about and they pick up the phone, they call me, they say, hey, dad, can you meet me for dinner? I, I want to run something by you. I don't even care what the subject is. Just getting the phone call and saying, hey, do you want to meet for dinner is the victory. Because then I did my, I won. I won as a parent. I did my job. Because it, it's just enough that they want to bounce something off of you that you've done your job. And in order for that to happen, it comes back to your question. You, you have to make sure they know that you know that they are a separate human. Mm, that's good. You, you have to have communication with your children when you say to them, Listen, you're not mommy and you're not daddy. You may not grow up to be a martial artist. You may not grow up to be a chiropractor or a CrossFit athlete. And you know what? That is completely, perfectly okay because you are your own person. Yeah. My job as your parent is to help you find your gift and what you're going to do at a very high level. You let me know what you're interested in and I'm going to put all my weight behind you to help you be successful in that. You know, and my, you know, look, in my world, my children train in our schools, in our martial arts schools, and they have asked me, Daddy, why do you make me do this when you've also told me that, and I simply said, because you're not, I'm not forcing you to grow up to be a martial arts master. I don't care if when you turn 18 years old, you drop this like a bad habit and you never do this again or make a career out of this. But the lessons that you're learning here about how to be successful in life are mandatory in our family. Yeah. And it comes back to what's in the highest and best interest of the child. So good. these lessons so good. are in your highest and best interest. And if you decide you don't want to use them to make a martial arts career, you're going to get my full backing and support in whatever you do choose. I don't care if you're going to be a janitor. I've told this to my children because we need to stop 
treating that position in society like it's a negative, right? I don't care what you do. As long as you tell me you're going to do it at the highest level and you're going to have joy and you're going to bring joy to other people at the job by doing that job, you're going to get my support. Yeah, I totally agree. My final question for you on this amazing, amazing podcast today was going to be, what's your biggest piece of advice for parents that want to create super kids and are unashamed about that, open about that, want to create great, amazing, connected kids that are in alignment with themselves and making a positive impact on humanity. But honestly, I think you just answered it. And it's consistently asking ourselves from your amazing father-in-law's perspective and insight that he gave you is what is in the highest and best interest of our children. I, I think that uh, I actually, believe it or not, I would put that as number number two. And again, this came from my father-in-law. Um, I think that's the second most important step. What's the first? I think the most important step is to start asking of ourselves what we ask of our children. I, I've seen so many parents wow. um, tell their kids that they have to go to karate or soccer five days a week and work out, and they don't work out. I tell, I see them telling their kids, you got to eat green beans and broccoli and they're eating fried chicken and other crap. Um, I tell, I see them wanting their children to have a healthy mindset and a healthy psychology and a healthy relationship with themselves and to use healthy words when they talk to themselves. And then they don't go to therapy. They don't work on their woundings because we're all wounded. We're all wounded, myself included, myself especially. We're yeah. all wounded. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there is something wrong with not addressing it. Yeah. So if we're going to be great parents and, and, and help our children become these wonderful super kids, why don't we start by becoming super people? Mm -hmm. Because then it's going to be a lot easier to coach from a position of experience. You said it earlier, experiential parenting and coaching. Like, it's very tough to tell your kid, you better work out five days a week. And then they look at you and go, oh, yeah, how many times you go to the gym? And you're like, hey, do as, you, do as I say. You know, not, you know not, not what I do, what I tell you to do. And it's like, you know, I think if we start with ourselves, like 80% of the issues get solved. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's definitely number one. I'm really glad you brought that up. I mean, I feel like there's so many key moments of this. My brain is... I just feel so blessed to be in this conversation. I'm so happy that we are bringing this podcast to the world because I think we've addressed so many things that parents may or may not be aware of in their parenting, but hopefully this can inspire all of us to be connected first to ourselves, to be in alignment, be healed so that we can be the best mentors that we can be because our children are watching everything we do. And I think that that's just so powerful. Um, and it, it helps us to avoid pushing and pulling our children instead it allows them to live inspired lives, fulfilling their zone of genius and their potential, which is such a beautiful thing as a parent. Yes. So, Thank I you. I love that so much. So if you guys want more of Master David Alvis, the director of USK Karate, full of wisdom, number one, I'm going to have him tell you where I follow him nearly every day. I love his insight. Um, and number two, we're going to join forces in early January to teach families about abundance, wealth creation, true wealth creation, financial management, um, as far as family financial management, and just help kids really get a healthy mindset around money because it's something that is just such a gift if we can teach our kids at a young age these tricks and secrets and strategies. And David is a true value every day of insight. So David, tell us where we can follow you on social media. Um, I don't know if you're, I follow you on Facebook, Instagram. So let us know. Yeah. Um, so if you, uh, and, and thank you for all the kind words. And I really, I really look forward to our conversations. It's refreshing to have these very unfiltered, uh, like you said, pull the veil back conversation. So thank you very much. I, I had a blast. Um, you can uh, Facebook and, and Instagram. If you just search USK Karate, you can find that there. And then also Financial Fitness Focus has uh, uh, pages, but also I have a free group for both Financial Fitness Focus and FFF4, the number four B-I-Z. If you search those groups, I'll let you guys in and then you can see the daily tips that we give. They're, it's, they're completely free groups just to you know help support the community. 
Yeah, I highly recommend it. It has really enlightened the way that I want to parent. It's helped take a load off my back. And as always, I help moms parenting coaches are right here to help you guys. If you're feeling overwhelmed as a mom, if you feel like your marriage needs some tweaking and that you want to make sure that you're really giving a vital relationship reboot so that your kids can see healthy relationship building. And most of all, if you have any questions on sleep, potty training, breastfeeding, anything um, regarding child behavior, we have incredible coaches right there on ihelpmoms.com and we save you hundreds of dollars because we do it by the minute because I've been there struggling and I don't want any other parents to struggle. So check out ihelpmoms.com. Thank you so much, David. My heart is full. My mind is full. I'm so excited to go pick up the kids today and just connect to them. So truly, thank you for being on with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. All right. We'll see you all in January. Come join David and I. Mm-hmm. <laughs>